Okay, so it's it's almost 11.01, so we can go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for everyone who's joining us both on Zoom and in the room right now. I apologize that you don't get access to donuts on Zoom. Um, I'm Rebecca Cummings. I'm the Interim Director of Digital Matters, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the 2022 Fall Digital Matters Research Talks. I can't wait to hear about the research that's been happening in the lab from our fellows and from our interns. Because we do have six presenters today in a short amount of time, I'm going to ask that you hold your questions until the end, and then we can pose those questions to all of our presenters at the same time. Um, this is being recorded today and will be available later on the Digital Matters YouTube channel. Um, just to keep things rolling, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our presenters right now. First, we're going to hear from Margaret Wong, who is a professor in World Languages and Culture and one of our Digital Matters faculty fellows this semester. Next, we'll hear from Luke Leiter, who is the Fine Arts and Architecture Librarian at the Marriott Library and also one of our faculty fellows this semester. Then we're gonna move on to the Digital Matters graduate student fellows. We'll first hear from Eliza McKinney, a master's student in the Department of History, and John Sutter, a master's student in the Department of Film and Media. And then we'll end with our two Digital Matters undergraduate interns this semester, uh, Eliana Massey, who is a double major in philosophy of science and her new major, Museum Studies, which she created all on her own, and Ashton Reeder, who is graduating this month from the Multidisciplinary Design Program. So thanks again, everyone, for coming today. Since we do have six presenters and may have to do some switches in technology, I appreciate your patience in advance while we do some of those things. All right, uh, thanks for having me. Um, I'm gonna jump right in and talk about my um, project uh, that focuses on a serialized publication called Topolsky's Chronicle. Um, but before I get specifically into that, I'm going to just briefly introduce you to the artist Felix Topolsky. Um, Topolsky was Polish, born in Poland in 1908. He um, grew up in Warsaw and attended the Warsaw Academy of Art. And then in 1935, he emigrated to uh, England, uh, which is where he lived for the rest of his life. Um, soon after immigrating, he became an official uh, correspondent and war artist and traveled all over um, the various fronts in World War II and gained some notoriety there. So he um, became a little bit famous um, uh, back home in England and um, was able to come back after the war, establish a studio and um, go on to have a, a really successful career um, as an artist. Uh, one of his many projects was uh, what he called Topolsky's Chronicle. Um, as the name suggests, this was a visual record of um, everything that Topolsky saw, that he experienced, um, and he really um, saw it as his way to um, record the world around him and uh, make it a priority to go to um, really important events and um, see, meet important people uh, during his lifetime. The Chronicle was a serialized publication, put it out every two weeks um, for over 25 years and is predominantly um, uh, visual, um, mostly drawing, uh, but there is uh, some text, uh, which is important, uh, an important part of this uh, project going forward. The style of the Chronicle, um, or his method um, for recording history was um, uh, called uh, reportage illustration or reportage drawing. Um, the, a brief definition of reportage drawing is um, uh, the artist needs to be on site witnessing a specific event um, and then uh, recording it in whatever manner um, they uh, you know, are specialized in. Usually it's draftsmanship, so drawing. Um, he, uh, Topolsky considered himself part of a lineage of, of uh, draftsmen and, and artists um, going all the way back into the 19th century um, with artists like Toulouse-Lautrec and Damier, who were um, reportage illustrators. They were on site and recorded the world around them. Um, this style of illustration really exploded in the uh, 20th century, early 20th century, when newspapers started to recruit illustrators and hire illustrators and send them out um, and publish their work um, in newspapers and magazines. Um, this reportage, uh, uh, illustration is uh, a rabbit hole that I've fallen way down into this semester. I didn't really necessarily see myself doing a, a lot of research in it, but it's been really interesting. Um, so this is uh, an example of uh, Topolsky's reportage illustration. Um, and I, I like to use it as an example um, because it, it does a lot of the things that illustrators are trying to accomplish. So to be uh, a successful illustrator, you need to be able to draw quickly. 
you need to be able to draw well. You need to be aware of the subjective nature of what it is that you're doing. So you are deciding, you know, you're drawing, so therefore you're thinking and you're deciding what am I going to include in my drawing? What am I going to not include? What's important? What's not important? Um, and then um, also be aware of, you know, drawing convention. So um, how to do, how to quickly uh, um, indicate shading or hair or movement, those types of things all um, are in the toolkit of a reportage illustrator. Um, and I think that this drawing uh, illustrates all of that really well. So um, this is Topolsky at the Royal Court Theater. Um, he was there at an event. He was notorious for carrying um, his, his pencils and paper wherever he went. He was always sort of um, uh, recording whatever it was that he was doing. Um, and what's interesting about this and what this showcases is, is this isn't a snapshot of the stage, right? Um, this isn't one particular scene the way that you'd see a photograph. These are um, this, these are the moments, the things that Topolsky found interesting. He's, he's catching the vibe of the show, right? So um, different costumes, different sets, um, you know, uh, certain stances, people's faces. These are the things that he is all sort of encapsulating over the course of the, of the show and putting into one image. And that's really what um, sets uh, reportage illustration apart from, say, photography, photography for example, because you can catch um, you know, a time lapse basically, um, and sort of capture that that vibe or that that feeling of place. Um, Tupolsky was everywhere. He knew everybody, um, and he really witnessed some really major events in the um, 20th century. So he started the Chronicle in 1954, and it went for over 25 years. Um, and he knew people like Elvis Presley, and yet nobody knows about it. Nobody knows about him. Nobody knows about the Chronicle. And the reason for that is, um, I'm sure this is very difficult to see, but this is um, the record uh, in the Merritt Library's catalog for Tchaikovsky's Chronicle. So the only things, way that you would ever be able to discover the Chronicle is search for Tchaikovsky's name, which not many people know, um, search for like caricature, uh, which, you know, if you're looking for Elvis Presley, information on Elvis Presley, how, why would you ever search for car caricature? Um, or the years, and basically that's it. It's not discoverable. There's no information about, more information about it in the record. So even if you came across the title in the record, you'd never know what it actually was. So this is a problem, right? Um, so if I'm searching for Malcolm X in the catalog, it's not gonna come up. And yet, Topolsky was there with Malcolm X days before he was assassinated. He um, did a, an entire series on him, uh, met him, and. Uh, you probably can't read it, but on this uh, sheet uh, that's in the Chronicle, he even says, you know, I was publishing this, I was printing this um, the day that uh, Malcolm X was assassinated. But he was really in the thick of it for, for a lot of different things. So what do we do about this? Well, I've tried a bunch of different things. One is proselytizing about Tchaikovsky, which you know hasn't been super successful. <laughs> Uh, another thing is uh, Justin Sorensen uh, here in the Marriott Library and a former employee, Zach Storms and I um, did a mapping project where we took one image from each issue that we have um, in, the, in the library and, um, and then created metadata around it. We even cre created a controlled vocabulary so you can search on that uh, controlled vocabulary um, and kind of see everywhere that he went. Um, or, you know, a lot of places that he went and some of the things that he did. Um, this is great. Uh, I'm proud of this. I think it, it works really well, but it, its scope is not big enough. So this project, um, what we've done is we've scanned every issue in the Mary Library. Oh, and I should have said, um, you subscribe, you subscribed to the Chronicle. Um, and then he would send you an issue every other week. Um, there was, it was um, not for profit and there was no advertising. So it really was just Tupolsky distilled down onto, onto the page and, and the Marriott Library subscribed for the entirety. Um, so what we've done is we've scanned um, every issue and um, we have uh, been working on uh, doing an OCR reading of all of the text. And what we're going to do or what we have been doing is um, ex be extracting um, place names, people, people's names, events, um, famous objects of art. Um, uh, I, I think those are the four categories of things that we're gonna we're going to extract, and then we'll be able to reapply that back into the metadata for each issue. So, if you searched for in the future Kenya or Kenyatta or inauguration 
all of those words are getting extracted and then putting back into the record. So this um, rally for Kenyatta would actually come up as a discoverable item and you'd be able to go um, and see the a series of sheets that um, uh, Tupolsky created specifically for that event. That is the plan, we're in progress. Um, I put a, a QR code here for um, the map if anyone wanted to go to that, that website. Hello, my name is Eliza McKinney. I'm a master's student in the history department. And the project that I've been so fortunate to build and that I'm presenting to you today is a digital archive called Women's Worlds. And it shares the history of lesbian community in the 1990s here in Salt Lake City. And this project began with a collection of newsletters called Women's Community News. This was a local newsletter started by Kathy Worthington, who you can see on the left in this photo. Uh, who created the newsletter in 1991 when she began a relationship with her lifelong partner, Sarah Hamblin, who's also in the photo. Uh, they worked on this together until 1995. I was gifted this collection somewhat randomly. Um, and as soon as I looked through them, I knew that I had a really valuable resource for so many people here. And I knew that the easiest way to do this, to make this available to the public was to digitize them. But I also really wanted to flesh out this history and make a more comprehensive archive. I didn't want the newsletters to just stand on their own, to only be seen by other researchers and historians. I wanted anyone interested in this history to have a way to enter that history and learn more about it. Uh, one way to do this is by including my own vignettes that contextualize and further explore issues discussed within the newsletters. While doing this research, I was really struck by how complex and dynamic the lesbian community was during this time. I think most people think that probably lesbians in the early 90s, that it was a small group, but it was actually really huge. Um, many didn't even know each other. It was so vast. Um, a way to show this vast community was by tracing the many groups and events within the newsletters. These included social, religious, and political organizations, as well as groups that catered to hobbies like bowling, which still exists today. If you want to join the Good Time Bowling League, they bowl on Sundays at Bonwood, uh, cycling, other crafts, music scenes, etc. The lesbians in the 90s held fundraisers and dances. They participated in the Gay Rodeo Association. They volunteered at places like Utah AIDS Foundation. They held political rallies and marches and fought in courtrooms and legislative sessions. They went to LGBTQ affirming churches and they have their own music and theater scenes. But to bring this large web of lesbian activity to life, I created audio tours that highlight spaces across the city, telling the vibrant history that they hold. These are spaces like the Utah Stonewall Center and LGBTQ Community Center put together by the Gay and Lesbian Community Council of Utah. Lesbian bars, we actually did have lesbian bars here, like Puss in Boots, businesses that cater to queer people like Lavender Moon, and churches like the Metropolitan Community Church, which is seen in the photo, it's that pink house there, which was run by LGBTQ clergy. Creating these tours uh, felt particularly significant to honor the many spaces that no longer exist today. A big part of establishing a valuable archive for me was to speak to the women who created this history. That's one of the benefits of being a historian of the 20th century. Many of the people who created this history are still alive. And when you're doing the 1990s, their memories are still sharp, which is a great value. It has been such an honor to speak to these remarkable women and to share their stories with others. And all of the oral histories that I've conducted and will continue to conduct are recorded and will be fully available to the public. Uh, the archive will be published in the spring and it will have a digital home so that people can find it. Um, although I suspect I'll continue to add to it in the years to come, I can't imagine this project uh, losing my interest. It's been such an amazing experience. Um, but I want to end today by encouraging all of you to become your own cultural stewards. 
So many of our histories in Utah remain uh, unexplored and unexamined. I'm certain that each of you in this room is part of a community whose history could easily be lost. I ask you to start collecting now and to save and preserve artifacts that bring your own communities to life. Digital tools have made this easier than ever before to preserve these histories. It's been such a gift that Kathy and Sarah gave to all of us. And I'm sure without ever knowing just how valuable those newsletters would be. And it's because of their own cultural stewardship that people like me can now reclaim our own history with honor. And I hope that you do the same. Thank you. We had planned on John going next, but because he has some particular AV needs, we're going to um, move on to Eliana. And John, is it weird if I just go quickly through your slides again? Yeah, okay, good. everyone, close your eyes. You don't want to say what's coming down, down the pipe. Hold on. And then tell me where to stop. Oh, don't look. There we go. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, so, hello, everyone. My name is Eliana Massey. And today, um, my presentation is titled Cultivating a Climate of Hope Digital Tools for Climate Secret Engagement. And I think that most people don't associate hope and climate change. I think most people are way more likely to associate climate change with something like despair or dread or <laughs> numbness. And all of these emotions are not adequate motivation for behavior change, which is necessary for the kind of climate action that we need. And even though fear, um, can be a powerful motivator for action or um, change in some way, even if it's just for a short term period of time, it also often leads to exhaustion and burnout, which is not conducive to the continual um, systemic engagement that we need to address climate change, um, to work towards adapting to climate change and also mitigating climate change in the world. Um, and I partnered with the Natural History um, Museum of Utah on this project, um, specifically the exhibits team, and they were lovely to work with. And I'm really excited to see how this is implemented in the museum. Um, they're working on, well, they've been working for few years on creating a new permanent exhibit that will be in their sky gallery on the fifth floor, um, tentatively titled um, A Climate of Hope about climate change and trying to give it a, a localized regional focus that's also hopeful and focusing on what are people doing, what can you do, um, and focusing on systems and how systems are changing um, and how you can be a part of that change. Um, and it's projected to come out September of next year. So you should definitely check it out once it comes out. Um, but to start, I just wanted to share a quote from the poet Adrian Rich, um, which is relevant to the topic of climate change and hope. Um, and she says, my heart is moved by all I cannot save. So much has been destroyed. I have to cast my lot with those who age after age, perversely, with no extraordinary power, reconstitute the world. And so when I started um, creating this presentation, I thought it would be good to sort of show my process for this project. So I started um, doing a literature review on climate change education and community engagement within museums and similar informal learning spaces like science centers. Um, and then I spent some time generating different ideas of what would work well with um, the needs of the Natural History Museum of Utah and their upcoming exhibit. And then we went through a little bit of design iteration and then planning for sustainability in terms of this tool and how it's going to be maintained and how it's going to be implemented into the exhibit. Um, so I'll just go through each of these steps briefly. Um, so when I was conducting my literature review, I um, went over a lot of um, research literature that has been written on the topic of 
museums and informal learning centers um, in terms of climate change education and climate change community engagement. Um, I've highlighted on this slide a couple that were really um, impactful. One of them is a chapter from a book. This chapter is called Museums That Connect Science and Communities. Um, and then another piece of literature was Museums as Agents and Settings for Climate Hope. And um, I also highlighted a little bit of something I read that was just talking about how knowledge is not enough to promote behavior change. Um, there are specific things that research has identified that are really powerful for helping people to take action. And some of those things are giving people a sense of agency, um, focusing on like their local environment, um, focusing on their values and their ideology and place attachment, things like that. Those are all really important in terms of climate change education. Um, climate change education is, isn't like other types of science education because of the emotional component and the political component. And so we have to take specific um, things into consideration when we're designing. Um, and I also looked at a, um, I also looked at other work that's been done in this area as sort of part of my literature review. Um, there's a Museums and Climate Change Network, and they've documented all of the different exhibits and museums related to climate change that have been um, installed since around 2000. And then I was also looking at the All We Can Save project, which is a community engagement project um, focused on climate action. Um, and then also I previously worked with the learning sciences curator at the Natural History Museum, Dr. Lynn Zumo. Um, and we have a publication coming out, hopefully soonish, um, titled, Am I the Only One That's Trying to Save the Environment? <laughs> Knowledge and Social Resources Drawn for Engagement in Collaborative Museum-Based Video Game about climate change, um, which was also helpful in sort of giving me a grounding in this space when I was working on this project. So I came up with nearly 10 different ideas. And then out of those ideas, I selected one based on feedback, feasibility, and foreseen impact. And this idea was related to a final interactive in the exhibit. Um, which is this Venn diagram. It's probably gonna become a digital interactive um, with three circles. One of them is kind of focused on like, what are you good at? What do you enjoy doing? Another one is like, what groups are you a part of already? Or what groups could you easily join? And then another one is, what is the climate work that needs doing in your community? What are the challenges that your community is facing? What do you care about? And the goal is to sort of find that middle ground in terms of, what you can do to um, activate your community to address climate change locally. So this is hopefully a model to move away from individual action like recycling or you know taking shorter showers um, and thinking about like how can you work with others to change systems even if those systems are small and local like that is really impactful and really needed. Um, and kind of as an example, I sort of filled out um, my project, which was this Climate Hope database, which I'll get to in a second. Um, and so there's sort of communities that I'm a part of, like Digital Matters and the Natural History Museum of Utah. And then some different skills that I have or things that I enjoy doing. And then also some of the issues that I was seeing um, in my community around climate change, including like a lack of community coordination, um, fragmented climate action information and then political and corporate interference in terms of finding that information. And so I worked in uh, the platform Airtable and I created this entry form that climate organizations in Utah can use um, to enter in information about volunteer opportunities that they have. And then this form will automatically populate to a gallery and then within the gallery, um, people who are interested in taking climate action in Utah can go to that gallery and they can filter and look through different volunteer opportunities. And the Natural History Museum of Utah will be hosting this 
um, on their website. And it will also be implemented in different ways throughout the exhibit. Um, still figuring that out exactly how. So I went through a lot of work in terms of identifying climate organizations in Utah. They did a massive spreadsheet. There's actually um, a lot more organizations in Utah focused on sustainability environmentalism than you might think. Um, but they're really hard to find because they're on so many different places. And so I tried to bring them all together um, into this list. And then I also worked on collecting and integrating organization feedback. I reached out to a couple of the organizations that I thought um, seemed most relevant to this project. And I let them fill out the form and then offer feedback on you know, whether or not they would use something like this and if there were any improvements that could be made to the form. And um, overall, their feedback was really positive and it was also helpful to be able to integrate um, some of their suggestions into the design. And then I also worked on building the gallery, um, which uh, you can kind of see here in terms of like the opportunities. And also you can see how you can filter um, based on different things like a climate action area. Like if you're most passionate about improving air quality, you can search for opportunities relevant to that. You can also search based on skills, um, which sort of connects with that um, values and ideology um, place. And so you, you know, can search based on what you're good at or what you're interested in, what you value. Um, and then in the museum, we tested this prototype with some museum visitors and that was helpful. Um, overwhelmingly, people were like, it was intuitive, it was helpful. I feel like I could find the information that I wanted. And I think that a small percentage of people who come to the exhibit will you know, utilize this resource, but it's very helpful for the percentage of people that want more information and that want to know how they can take action in their community. Um, and we were also able to identify some different uh, issues and some things that we could work on in our design. I also worked quite a bit on documenting this process, um, creating some videos and um, data management plans and stuff like that, um, because I hope that you know this will be easy for the exhibits team to maintain. And I also hope that in the future, if anyone's interested in replicating something like this for another location, maybe you know, they want to do it in Texas or Arkansas or something, that they can see the process that I went through. And so it's easy to replicate. Um, and then finally, in terms of implementation, um, that is something that the Natural History Museum of Utah um, is going to be figuring out in all their different departments and through the engagement and exhibits and marketing and stuff like that. Um, but it will definitely be integrated into their website. Um, and it will also um, be promoted on their social media. There will probably be signage at the end of the exhibit with like a QR code or something like that. Um, there's possible integration into a digital interactive based on some future um, prototype test results. Um, there's possible integration through handouts at the end of the exhibit or through gallery interpreters um, demonstrating how to use the website and talking with visitors. Um, and then there's definitely also a possible integration with the community engagement programming team. Um, I know that they have hopes to invite some of the people who are in these organizations to come table at the exhibit. Um, and so I'm just really excited to see how it will be implemented. And I feel really lucky to have worked on this project. And I'm really grateful for the exhibit team and um, their generosity and expertise. Um, and then just as acknowledgements, I just have special thanks to several different people who helped out quite a bit with this project. Um, mostly, you know, on the exhibits team, but also digital matters and so that's it. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. So 58.6 gigabytes. That is the amount of data that Google had on me. I went through many different companies and I request my data from probably like 50 to 100 different companies. I have a list somewhere, but it was insane. It took so much time. 58.6 gigabytes is what Google had just on me alone. And that backtracked all the way to about 2013 when I was 14 years old. And it tracked all my movements, activities, web activity, 
purchases pretty much everything about me since I was the age of 13 or 14 there. And so this inspired kind of a project looking into this concept of data surveillance, which is this, it's a subsector of surveillance, which really uh, is more corporate focused. And it's all about corporate digital tracking. And so I'm gonna walk through some of my artifacts. I come from a product design backward, or background, so I have a lot of visual artifacts as well as some product responses, conceptual products that I'll talk about towards the end. So this industry right here is about $450 billion a year. It is massive and it is not likely to change very much. So the data industry simplified is, it's pretty simple. Uh, it starts with like an individual existing, we go throughout our day and pieces of data are harvested by a corporation. Those data go from us to a corporation where they're then processed and sold to a group of companies called data brokers. Data brokers are companies that deal, buy, sell, trade in data. That's all they do, and they use this data to fuel predictive algorithms, make financial decisions, make marketing reports. But in short, our data is just a resource that is being sold and shared between everybody. So one of my first little experiments here was I wanted to look at surveillance, the surveillance structure that exists in Salt Lake City. So I was originally on just kind of a surveillance track. So I began by going through and tracking and marking out every single camera that I could find in downtown Salt Lake City. And what surprised me is there wasn't as many cameras as I anticipated, but I did notice some patterns where there were very heavy roof sections of surveillance presence. And that was mainly around uh, areas of uh, capital, like uh, this little bundle right here, kind of on the right is the Federal Reserve. Obviously with money, there's gonna be a lot of cameras and it really pointed and reinforced this idea that like surveillance doesn't necessarily exist to only protect us, but it exists to protect property. So I wanted to go and explore that even further. So we can just go through this map of downtown kind of on that main street block here. We're gonna continue through to like this big data viz of like who harvests our data. So one of my uh, big objectives was to kind of like do a name and shame here. And so I went through and I <laughs> collected pretty much every company that I could find that I had the finger strength to type out and map them out on this massive data viz of about 1200 different companies. So uh, on the left, you'll start to see sectors appear, which these sectors, I kind of rank them in from top to bottom and how pervasive their data harvesting practices are. So we have like aerospace and defense, technology, financials, telecommunication, business services, media, healthcare, retailing. These are kind of the top sector. And then we kind of go into this middle area of like household products, um, motor vehicles, food and drug stores, where they still track you and they still harvest data, but it isn't quite as pervasive. And then we can keep going down and there's some other businesses and categories, but that those were the, the outliers. And so then it kind of brought up this question of like, what harvests our data? Pretty much any digital thing you interact with on a daily basis, whether it be swiping into work or just living in your home and you have like maybe um, a smart thermometer or a smart TV, everything you own is tracking every single pretty much movement of what is going on. So on the left, we have uh, devices of what is like what devices we might have. And then towards the right, they connect to individual data points. And I got to thank Kyle right here in the front. Kyle and I spent a lot of time assembling this data sheet right here. But yeah, so we just have some like smart home devices and some of the main ones were like social media devices and just our phones, our phones track pretty much everything. But these all exist as just individual data points. So I wanted to go through and like kind of map out what these look like in the typical day. So I constructed this timeline of where data, data harvesting actually occurs. And this is very long, this is a 24 hour period, I believe it was November 16th, but I tracked about 3000 data points that I created. I project that each one of these creates like three to five times more throughout the day. So probably 15 to 20,000 individual data points. So we're going to go through and just look at this for a second, but you can kind of see clusters when I'm out and about what I'm doing. And these, this is all data points that are used to interpret it or assume my schedule, my how I go throughout my day and ultimately used to profit upon. It. And this is happening to everybody in this room constantly. So finally, this leads us to a marketing report. And these data points are collected and they're boiled down through algorithms and predictive algorithms to create marketing reports which are used to sell and sell us products. And I was able to get a hold of one of my marketing reports. This is from Experian, a data broker. It was actually very difficult to get a hold of this. When I requested it from them, I was denied. But when I requested it from Xfinity, 
I was accepted and they actually sent me my Spirit report. And so what this is, is pretty much a bunch of categories like likelihood to donate to charities, likelihood to buy a new used car. And they have those categories and they give you values. What I went through is I took all those values and I wanted to see how valid they were. And I found by ranking them myself, it was kind of a, it wasn't scientific at all, but if I deemed a value incorrect, I put an X and about 50% of these 350 values were deemed incorrect by me. They were just wrong. And whether it be in my financials or what I what my interests are, they were wrong, which is interesting because so many decisions are made off these marketing reports. Marketing reports. So we're gonna scroll through here. There, there's just so much data that I thought like having a long uh, presentation here would be good. And then I kind of went to this, or I wanted to outline the process of obtaining data. And there's two distinct pathways. There's the process of requesting your own data, which is very difficult. Over here on the left, I'll kind of walk through and show what that looks like. But there's a bunch of barriers in place. It took hours to even try to get my data from many of these companies. But as soon as I posed as a corporation trying to purchase consumer data, I had responses within the hour. And so over here on the right, we have the process of purchasing data as a company, right? Over there is me on the left. You can just see, like I mapped out every single step and it just kept going and going. I was denied from all three of these companies and multiple times I'd go on phone calls that lasted upwards of 20, 30 minutes just to be denied. I had to mail stuff in and just wasn't, wasn't fun. So this final little bit is just a timeline of data privacy laws. There's a distinct lack of data privacy laws in existence in America and on the horizon. There have been some great strides on strides for independent states like Utah. I believe at the beginning of 2023, we are going to have a pretty great uh, law going to place where we there's more transparency, but it still just goes on to about three states. It'll be Utah, Virginia, Colorado, and California. So we can scroll through. Meanwhile, in Europe, they have a great data privacy structure with laws that I think we should follow and it's wonderful. There's great data transparency. So this led me to kind of my product design session where it's, I wanted to, I was angry with this process and I wanted to like identify ways to disrupt the data stream. And so the data stream at its simplest level is just the individual and their data is being harvested by a corporation. So I wanted to create some conceptual products that might like prompt ideas that might kind of fit into that data stream right there. And so there were three general um, concepts that we could follow here. And I was like, you could delete the stream, you could completely remove yourself from the stream, not send data, which hurts the bottom line and might change the, or create change in these processes. Um, there's also sending fake data. We could create devices or apps that might send fake data also subverting um, the corporate surveillance. And then the, or the final one is kind of overloading the system. Like what happens if we just send an exuberant amount of data to the companies? Is it usable? Um, is that good? I don't know. So yeah, I think my final statement is just like protest the system. And I think we need to take back our privacy because we are losing our digital autonomy or digital autonomy as um, the technological age goes forward. So I'll quickly touch base on these few products, but these are just conceptual products that kind of act as data, uh, data scramblers. We have one that's kind of like to protect you on the go. It's a phone that has data infusing tech uh, technology, so you can go and have some sort of privacy on the go. And then we have just two other ones that would exist within your home and scramble your data. So they act as kind of a middleman in your devices, your in-home devices would connect to them and they would connect to your router. So you'd be able to scramble and have more autonomy over your data before they send out to companies. Two companies. So that is data valence. And I'd love if anyone wants to interact with any of these, I can pass them around, but I think we gotta move on. Thank you, Ashton. We have to do something with the audio right now. John, come on up and we're gonna to try to figure this out. All right. Um, hey everyone, um, my name is John Sutter and I'm the problem person with difficult AV problems. Um, where I, I'm a, in the film department here at the U and so that's why I, ha I have some like audio visual stuff to, to share with you um, and we'll, we'll see how it goes. If it doesn't work, then I can just sort of talk, talk you through it. Um, so I, before I came to the U, I, I worked for about like 10 or so years as a climate journalist. Um, and 
over time, I, you know, like became very concerned about this idea that we're talking about before, like that, that knowledge is not enough. Like, I felt like, okay, I'm telling these stories over and over and over again. And for some reason, it's not sinking in, in a real way. And like on a, on a society level, like, you know, whatever storytelling we're doing collectively hasn't resulted in the whole scale, like systemic changes that are needed to deal with something as big as the climate crisis. So I don't think there's any one reason for that, but I started reading about this idea of, of shifting baselines and got pretty freaked out by it. And then it sort of like motivated um, uh, like a, a few different projects, which I'm gonna touch on um, here. And th this idea is essentially like the metaphor that gets used like kind of unfairly is the frog in the boiling pot of water. It's this idea that we are terrible as people at processing slow moving long-term change. Um, so climate change is kind of like the key um, example of this. We just don't don't feel it or make sense of it in a really clear way. And so I've been trying to think about like, okay, how can I use media to at least like explore that, if not do some things to try to like um, maybe counteract it a little bit. Um, and the first project I want to show you just a little clip from is a... Uh, Let's see. Are you all seeing a person on screen? No. Um, maybe I could just open the, on here I'm seeing it, but it's not showing up there. Yeah. Um, is that in Finder? Oh, here we go. Okay. Um, so this is like a, like a little four minute clip um, from a feature length documentary that's called Baseline Part One that should come out next year and that I'm directing. And the um, this is, you're dropping in like midstream, this is like 20 or 30 minutes in. Um, so the things that you would need to know to like make this make sense is the premise is that it's following three kids growing up on the front lines of the climate crisis. And the conceit is that it promises to revisit them in the year 2050. So it's like, a non-scientific but longitudinal approach to try to get us to like feel and think about time in a in a different way um and it's the film has a voiceover you'll so you'll hear my like awkward voice in it um and it, it's it's written as a letter to these kids in the year 2050 so that's like when you hear me talking that's what's going on there So it's playing, but the video isn't loading. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna skip past that. Um, so the oh, and now none of the images are loading in the presentation, which is new. <laughs> hmm. Um, let me try to play this and let's, let's see if it works. If you all have trouble hearing, I can just jump forward. I probably own a farm when I get older. Hear that. Teach my kids what, what it's like to grow up on a farm and how to work. Um, you can get a lot of life lessons out of doing this. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of if, if the cow's moving, it does pull it, so it happens less to look at you. So right here, you want to practice touching it and pulling it, okay? So this is one of the three kids in the film. He's in Utah, actually. The other two are in other parts of the world. Yeah. Yeah. 
The drought in the West had been going on for 20 years when we met Monty. That was longer than you'd been alive at that point, and about half of my lifetime. Neither of us had ever actually experienced weather that's normal. I don't know what to make of that. I find a little comfort in the fact that scientists are at least trying to quantify these changes that are happening all around us. So I'm going to go ahead and stop it there just because I'm going to guess that this next part might be a little bit hard to hear. But the, the again, the conceit of that project is it's following these three kids. It's sort of personal stories, but woven in there is our um, interludes with scientists like Ralph Keeling, whose father started measuring the buildup of CO2 in the atmosphere in the 1950s. And he's his father's passed away, but he's continuing those measurements now. And like we're able to make sense with like data, right, of in a very clear way, like, you know, this is what's happening to the buildup of CO2. Here's what's happening to temperature. I'm interested in like why we don't feel it that way. I don't think we feel it as an escalating line. I think that the level of alarm kind of it sort of feels the same all the time, even though in reality the the stakes are getting um higher and higher. Um this is a guy named Daniel Polly who coined the term shifting baseline in reference to like to fishery science actually. Um, and one of his grad students collected these photos from a dock in Key West, Florida. They're all taken at the same at the same location. And it's like, you know, people who go fishing showing off like the giant fish that they catch. And the interesting thing about these photos are is that because of overfishing, they're shrinking across time. Oops. Um, and yeah, like the point that the that Daniel Polly makes is that like the fishermen in the photos, their like smiles are the same. Their reactions to this, you know, shrinking of the fish is sort of like the same throughout, which is like, oh, I caught these cool these fish. This is great. And like that is great. I'm not trying to like make that seem depressing. <laughs> I just I'm just trying to I'm just trying to say like I, I'm trying to put a finger on this idea that that we have a really hard time processing long-term change and that's especially troubling when you think about climate so like the first um like area that I started thinking in in terms of approaching this with digital matters and then like a project for the you because that film is something separate um I, I thought about like okay where do we interact with weather the most it's like on like your weather app um and a simple thing that I wish would happen is that you know th there was some sort of like average temperature bar or like the you know entire range from the historic record like some sort of visual indication of like is this normal or not because i think people often think like it's really hot in the summer you're like it, like is that normal i don't know like I, I i've only lived in utah for three years so i have a hard time gauging just in my gut like what is normal or not the the problem with that is that if you look at like noah's weather data what they call normal is uh a data set that goes back only to 1991 um you know we started burning fossil fuels in the 1850s and the effects have been accumulating since then and so like that normal isn't actually normal it is a shifted baseline right 1991 is not like a normal climate um so but there are like individual records for like specific days going back a long time this one's from like today, December, what are we, December 7th, um, I pulled this this morning from, it's 1874, uh, and there's this other thing that exists in, like, NOAA land, which is, like, if you, any of you have, like, a NOAA weather radio or are a weather nerd, you know, they, they put out these um, daily forecasts in, like, a very, like, robot voice where they just read all the data from that particular day, um, and so what I'm 
interested in doing is and that is very not very much like not finished but is in, in progress is is an installation that like incorporates some of these things and tries to get people to think about what we do and don't know about whether today is unusual like is it unusually hot is it unusually cold is it unusually wet it, it's a hard thing to answer um again time and climate exists on like decade and century time scales we exist minute to minute day to day like you know at lately especially this time of the semester so um it's it's hard to get our brains around this and so what i'm thinking is that an installation that just pokes at that and questions that might be the way to go so i'm planning to make sort of those robotic noaa weather recordings for um uh, for the current day going like well back into time and have that kind of be this like confusing muddled soundscape paired with you know data like what we have from the Keeling curve and like current and archival imagery that just gives you a sense of like you know the magnitude of the changes that are happening around us this is like I, I found this when I was working on that film baseline and it's 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 in there it's it's from the 1890s I believe um it was like a Lumiere Brothers uh production it's one of the first like film images um and it's an, an oil field and like I don't know to me looking at that is it makes it feel like tangible and shocking in a way that's different from just sort of experiencing the world around us today and and, and expecting that all of it is normal so um, it's kind of hard to describe an installation, but like <laughs> that's those are the ideas that I'm playing with is using that historic record of forecasts and also the I mean you has a great library of like um, TV weather forecasts also um, and trying to play with stuff from the particular day when a visitor would come uh, just to get people to think about this idea of shifting baselines and what we are and aren't able to perceive about the the magnitude of the changes that are happening around us. Thank you so much, John. Thank you to all of our researchers for the work you've done this semester, for sharing your research with us. We have some time for questions. So if anyone, do we have any in chat right now? Okay. Do we have any in the room? Jeff? Oh, Yeah, so one of the biggest ones we've seen in the financial sector, not all of our data is used for that, but a big section of our data is data to make financial decisions. And that could be based on our, that could decide to get credit cards, the loan you get a mortgage in to enter the industry. And the scary part, which I, I left out my algorithm section in this presentation, but the scary part with the algorithms is some of the few industries or, I guess, mm -hmm. systems in place that has no oversight. So when a company employs an algorithm that uses our data, often they're predicting the future based off the past, and there's no regulatory board to see what is making those, those decisions. And we never, on the consumer side, we don't really get to see why those decisions are made. We just get to guess what the And they're increasingly used in the industry. So I watched a movie or a film where they're being used, they're being used for uh, like hiring by teachers, student you know, firing teachers, um, parole decisions, it goes down the line. Kevin? Uh, thanks, everybody. That was absolutely fascinating. I love the variety of projects. Um, my, I have a comment and a question for Eliana. So the, the comment is whenever I think about hope, Reminded of Rebecca Saunders' book Hope in the Dark. So that's one that's not on your radar and for everybody that's doing the wonderful meditation on hope. Um, the question is I, I really like to have the, the systematic process of idea generation and you know, 10 ideas and then settle on one. I'm curious, like, what was in second place in that idea? So, you know, and, <laughs> and especially if there was one that mostly got asked because of feasibility, I'd love to hear just a little bit about what, like, the, the big idea might have been that you could quite do. 
If, if that's okay. Um, Luke, I'm so fascinated by your project. I think Topolsky's Chronicles are amazing. And I know that we had talked early on about doing something with tagging of the images. It's always easier in digital humanities to revert back to text because we have OCR, it's more searchable. I'm wondering if there's anything you considered doing with images that you weren't able to do because you came up against some kind of uh, technical challenge or brick wall or just the time available to do these projects in a semester? Yeah, so it's time. So the Chronicle itself has over 3,500 images. Um, and, you know, there's some software out there that I looked at that basically allows you to go in and, and, and tag each image, you know, come up with a, a keyword that you tag each image, which, you know, you could do, but it would take a really long time. And, I mean, Tupolsky is an amazing artist, but he's a little bit, indecipherable sometimes what he's actually drawn you know it's like uh he's, as i i keep referring back to the vibe or this feeling of place like he really gives you the sense of the place but tagging specifically like oh this is so and so you know you have to kind of go back and read a little bit and uh, he has this amazing autobiography that's insane um uh, so you can sort of decipher what what he's trying to get across in terms of the chronicle by reading the um, biography but you know it's it's a it's a worthy task and there's a lot of interesting stuff happening with AI right now and, and uh, doing image analysis that I'm interested to see um, if that progress a little bit and maybe do a treatment with tools and software um, it's a little bit different. Jeff did you want to pull out another question? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, uh, Margaret, I really appreciated your presentation. I, I thought some of your thoughts about DH um, in terms of like scope switching between distant and close reading, thinking about DH um, as sort of like our visualizations as a, as a kind of finding aid are really generative. Um, I'd love to see more along those lines. Uh, my, my question for you is, is um, in doing this sort of broad scope DH work, did you learn any lessons about the materiality of these novels that, you, that you're reading about? Is there any connection between sort of, you know, broad, big, big picture DH methods um, and answering questions sort of back in the world of, of material culture uh, about the novels? Does that make sense as a question? Um, if by materiality, you mean kind of history of the book and issue and publication sort of stuff. Um, that's a piece I'm still working on connecting. Um, but my previous project suggests that there could be a very strong tie. Um, my previous uh, book was on drum ballads, which are a, a regional uh, form from the 19th century 
and I found um, that the space that was depicted within them um, correlated with how widely distributed mm -hmm. the particular uh, text became. Now, whether that's, it may be chicken and egg, right? But it, it was an interesting um, correlation for me. So I would be very interested to see um, because what we know about the history of the book in China, as I was saying at the beginning of the talk, is that um, publishing actually broadened out geographically over time. So instead of kind of the centralization that you see in Europe where everything is published in London, right? right you know, it went out into the hinterlands. You know, you had uh, peasants who were doing woodblock printing. Even if they couldn't read, they could carve. Um, so, you know, what at this moment, if I had to have a guess, it looks like we have a narrowing in of space at the same time that we have a broadening out of access, which is interesting, you know, again, that all these places are dropping off the map. And, you know, does that have to do with authorship? Does that just have to do with the tropes of the novel um, becoming developed enough that there's a certain way that you write these stories? Does that have to do with how integrated the Chinese empire was? Because this is a question that historians debate, right? To what extent was Beijing actually a capital or was it just a regional center, right? My research suggests that to a large extent, it probably was actually a capital, right? Um, but so I think that there's promise there, but connecting those two dots takes an awful lot of time. Um, and so I'm going to have to really do it on a case by case basis. Um, and I haven't gotten far enough to be able to say anything. Thank you. Really exciting. Thank you. 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 Any other questions? Yeah, I still have a few, but um, Ashton, do you mind if I direct ones towards you? Because it's in my brain of legislation you were mentioning is more robust in Europe than it is here. If you had to give one example of a piece of legislation that would have like um, protect our privacy and our data privacy, do you have one that you could think of offhand? Yeah, so the best piece of data privacy legislation is called the GDPR. It is from Europe, the European Union, it is what uh, California made their laws off of pretty much allows us the right to privacy and the right to be forgotten, allows us to access our data and delete our data and opt out of our data being collected and opt out of our data being sold. Those are all different options to get, which slowly are entering their way here, but it's not quick enough. Yeah, as soon as it does, that disrupts a $450 billion a year industry. And the cool thing is if they violate the GDPR in Europe, they pay up to 4% of their revenue per year in a fine, and that's revenue, not profit. So that is massive. So they're really good about protecting consumer data. So there's hope. There are things that we could do that we're not doing. Um, okay, we just have a couple minutes left. Any other questions? Jeff? I have a question for Eliza as well. Um, uh, really fascinating. I also love sort of the, the multi pronged approach of creating an archive and personal connection that you made and, and uh, sort of posed to us as an imperative. I appreciate that. Um, in terms of your time period, it, it sounds like you're like really on the cusp of um, communities becoming digitized themselves. Um, have you encountered any sort of like early internet or other kinds of uh, maybe technological communities um, that, that facilitated these kinds of communities that you're studying? Yeah, um, there's a really great book that's about lesbians on the internet in the early years, and I can't remember the name of it, it's the author. Her last name is McKinney, so it's my last name. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really great cover. Um, but there is some really good scholarship about that transition. And, and we do see this like huge downturn in newsletters in feminist communities in general. Mm -hmm. There's part of all women's movements, um, both liberal and conservative. And those really go by the wayside when we get early internet. Um, which is rough because a lot of that early internet was lost. But there is some, some good scholarship about, about that change. So maybe that's like a, a book in to your, your archive chronologically or something. Yeah. Yeah. That's it.
information activism with queer history of lesbian media technologies by Kate McKinney. Yeah, I think that's it. There's the cover. The cover is really. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> I love whenever we have librarians in the room. They're like, "Is this the thing?" That you're <laughs> for? Uh, I have a question for John, actually, and I don't know if you'll have an answer to this because it's it's tricky. You were talking about shifting baselines and how like we're okay, 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 and I assume there's a point at which those fisherman smiles would start to, to deteriorate. You know what? Well, at what point is there research around the fact where the baseline is felt in a more visceral way, like with climate change? Like, do we have to be starving? If you've, I mean, you've thought about this quite a bit. At what point yeah. is it not okay anymore? I don't know. I know that I don't want to find out. Like, <laughs> 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 um, I mean, there are tipping points for it in the, like the climate system, right? Where, um, like bigger shifts happen more quickly. I used to think, I mean, I've spent a lot of time over the years, like in like disaster sites, like map maps and hurricanes and fires and things. And um, I used to think that if people like got the science in a way that they connected it to those events, which do get a lot of attention and are alarming, that like that somehow would like be a push and, but they're, they're I can't remember the researcher, but there, there's been some social science on that and uh, those sorts of climate disasters also get normalized, you know, like they have to get bigger and bigger in order to shock and there's not evidence that they shock into action. And so I don't have an answer <laughs> around it. I just, I think it's like, it's something that I think that we have to become aware of because I think there's a lot of the climate movement and a lot of media that's built around assuming that's true, that like that like you show the thing and it will alarm people and then that will result in action. And it's not just like a foregone conclusion. And I don't think it's like there's one thing, like if we realize the shifting baseline is like a huge issue, like that's gonna fix all of it. But it, I do think it's like a part of that puzzle. Um, but at first I found that really disheartening, like, oh, okay, like these massive and deadly and catastrophic events, like. I think they do wash over people unless you're in them, but they happen in this globally dispersed way where it's not like all it, it adds up in a way that you personally feel that progression, I guess. I figured there was not an easy answer there, but I just was curious your yeah. thoughts. Okay, so we only have a minute. Um, oh, Jeff. Just just be backing up that. I mean, one of the things that's really apparent in all your projects are uh, about sort of like recovering stories to some extent, uh, particularly in the past, or preventing, uh, you know, historical stories that might happen to us in the future with data that we don't want. Um, is, is there, like, do you see, in terms of making an impact in the way that you think about climate change, like, an effectiveness of, I mean, the video that you pulled up that's a century old, like, like, is there an effectiveness that's sort of seeing the world as it once was in a place or a time in which, like, we in the present didn't live? Is that a way of, like, sort of recovering a uh, usable history that shows that like, oh, right, this time that we live is like not normal or like, you know, it wasn't normal then even or, or whatever. Is that, is that yeah. like a, 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 an emotional rhetorical tool? I, I think so. On the emotional rhetorical, you know, angle, like in each of the three locations, like part of the reason I chose them was because there was some sort of visual archive of the place and that you could like feel that shift, even if it's not like a quantifiable um, one. So like, uh, you know, archive imagery of like a time before this current mega drop, for example. Um, and, th and there are projects like, I mean, there are films called Chasing Ice and Chasing Coral uh, that are completely about the idea of like longitudinal photography and like taking time series imagery that like proves the existence of a change. like. If you see a coral reef disappearing, um, that does have an emotional gut punch. If you see a glacier retreating, um, and in that line of work, like it is, it's the photographers have gone back into archives from like the late 1800s, early 1900s, and gone to like painstaking lengths to like exactly replicate some of that imagery. And it is really, um, it is really powerful. Uh, I guess like for me, I'm I'm less interested in like 
proving that change. I feel like we know that, and I, I'm interested in like trying to feel it and to feel some sort of nostalgia around it. Um, I guess I think that that I don't know if it's motivating, but it is. It, I do think it's like a deep emotional like resonance when we can like at least get a glimpse of like the magnitude. So two quick things. If you want to stay apprised of what Digital Matters is doing, of internship and fellowship opportunities and events, please do join our listserv. You can sign up at the front of the room or go to digitalmatters.utah.edu to do that. The other thing is that we're hosting Digital Humanities Utah again this year, not here at the university, but in Cedar City in February. Um, they're still accepting proposals, I think until Friday, maybe the 15th. It's coming up soon. So if you are interested in presenting at Digital Humanities Utah, um, our seventh annual symposium, uh, get that in possibly as soon as the 11th. Um, and that's gonna be in February again in Cedar City. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much to our presenters. If you'll join me in one last round of applause. Hope everyone with your finals. Everything else you have going on this week.